Good morning. My name is Ben Chapman. I did not introduce myself, and I am one of the pastors here at Luminous Church, and I love this church. I love being a part of this community and what God's doing in this place. I, I am excited because um, today is the day that we typically say this is Vision Sunday. We announce it, we make a big deal out of it, we put flyers up, we pay for Facebook ads, and we try to fill this space and, and, and get people excited about what Luminous Church is doing this year. And I want to let you know that we're excited about what Luminous Church is doing this year, but, but the vision this year is not as big as Win the City or Risk or Heaven Open. It's actually very simple. Very simple, and I want to explain why, but you know, something that I've often heard is simple is not easy. Have you found that to be true? Like doing something simple, like consistency in your life seems pretty simple, but how many of you know that's not necessarily easy? Easy. So I want to talk about walking. What does it mean to walk? If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in two very familiar verses this morning. The first one is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. You can turn there, save your spot, highlight it, copy it to your notes, do what you do to learn it and memorize it. The second thing, or the second verse, is Psalm 119, verse 105. You probably know that verse as well. And I want to talk about what it means to walk and what it looks like to walk. But before I do, I want to do an exercise this morning because I thought it would be fun. So if everybody would look on the back of their chair and they would grab a connect card, go ahead and grab a connect card, grab a pen. And I want you to write your name on this connect card. If we don't have any of your information, you've been missing our emails, you've, you know, you want me to stalk you with that phone number, just go ahead and fill that out as well. I want you to grab this connect card, and you'll see this box right here. It says prayer requests and praise reports, and, and, uh, and I want you to use this box for this exercise. Everybody have a pen? Everybody have a card? If you don't have a card or a pen, then, then you just aren't saved. So I just I need, to, I need you to get a card and a pen and just, you know, prove, prove that, man, God loves you. I'm just kidding. I'm playing about that if you know me. If you're a guest, I'm so sorry. But what I want you to do is I want you to grab this pen. I want you to place it in the box. I want you to hold this pen on this box where it's making contact with the box. You can choose wherever to start. I like to start on top left. Some people like to start in the center. Some people like to start on the bottom right. Like, let's just get this over with, the end. And so, so I want you to start right there. And then I want you to keep in contact with that paper. And I want you to close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. Keep that pen on the paper. Keep it right there in the box. Don't start moving it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to instruct us to play a game this morning, a game called Blind Pictionary. And what I want you to do as your pen's right there, I want you to begin to draw something that I'm about to say. Now, Jasmine's staring at me like I'm crazy. So, Jasmine, I just expect you to close your eyes right now, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close my eyes as well. We're all closing our eyes. We're all kind of strange right now, kind of weirded out. What has Pastor Ben up to today? And I want you to draw a picture. And the picture that I want you to draw today, without looking, is a self-portrait. Ready? Go. Draw a self-portrait. Make sure you draw your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your hair or lack of hair, your, your manly beard, or your, you know, whatever you need to draw. Maybe you want to draw something that you love next to that picture. Maybe a house. Maybe you want to draw a car. Maybe you want to draw your favorite animal, a dog. You know, maybe it's a Pomeranian or something of that sort. And I want you to draw. And we're going to just take a couple more minutes drawing. I'm drawing a sun right now. And now I'm going to draw some clouds over my head because, you know, it was kind of cloudy today. You know, it's like Bob Ross style right here. So, all right. On the count of three, we're all going to look. One, two, three. Look at your self-portrait. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Show your neighbor your self-portrait. Go ahead and show them what you drew. Show them your skills. Oh, wow, I heard a, oh, my goodness, you draw good. You draw good for being blind this morning. Wow, that's, that's just amazing. That's amazing. Oh, my goodness. Come on, Pastor Austin, let me see what you drew right there. Let me, let's just exchange these. 
Pastor Austin drew a robot, but, you know, that's, that's great. I mean, I love it. I love what you drew here. Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your self-portrait right after service. I want you to drop it in the tithe and offering box. And hopefully your name's on there because we got to use this picture. We need to use this picture for our database for your profile picture. So can you just drop it in the tithe and offering box? Can we agree to do that this morning? Can all of us agree to do that this morning? Ten. We're going to have ten people in the database. Come on. So, so this is so fun. It's so fun. When I think about Blythe Pictionary, I think about drawing the self-portrait. When I think about that, you, you realize, like, this doesn't look anything like me. Does that look anything like you? Does that have anything to identify with you? I mean, maybe you drew some eyes or some, some noses or, or noses. That was, that was plural on purpose because that's what it looks like. Maybe some noses or, some, you know, an ear or whatever it is. But it doesn't look anything like you. And I want to petition you this morning. I want to petition you that if you go through life blind, you paint a picture or an identity of yourself that is distorted and not truly the picture that God intended you to be. If you go through blind where, where you can't see, you find yourself looking like something that is unrecognizable on how God created you to be. Some of us draw pictures by the house that we have, the cars that we drive, the outfit that we wear, the nails that we did. You know, some of us paint a picture that way. Some of us paint a picture through all these material things, the accolades and affirmation of your friends. The, the, the co-workers are speaking to you of how great you are or how ungreat you are, how unworthy you are. And you go through life, and if you go through life blind... You paint a picture that God didn't intend for you to be. And I want to just encourage you this morning, as we're in this series, that God has designed you to look exactly how he wants you to look. And it's not a cerebral thought, but it's an internal heart that he has shaped and molded and created you to be this morning. I want to encourage you with that. Can I get an amen? Come on. Somebody got to help me this morning. My, my whole job, my whole job, my whole prof profession, the reason that I exist is so that you are able to see who you really are. It's for you to see who you are and how God created you to be and how you can make a difference being who God created you to be. When I was thinking about this year, I, I was reflective of last year, and Pastor Jim LaFoon, who's a pastor in our movement of churches, Every Nation, he came and did an Engage the Spirit. And Engage the Spirit, he spoke a word, and I emailed the word to everybody in our church, the thousand people in our database. I emailed them the, this word that he gave at Engage the Spirit. Now, 18% opened the email, so I'm assuming that the 18% is you this morning. But if not, I want to just recap this word. Maybe you're a guest with us. He said two things. He said that Luminous Church is going to be a church marked by miracles. It's going to be a church marked by miracles. And when I hear that word, miracles, I think about what a miracle is. A miracle is essentially when you've done all you can in your own power and God intervenes and moves you to a different place or does something different in your life. It's a miraculous intervention when you're at the end of yourself, when you couldn't create it. You cannot create your miracle. It is when God moves past your situation. And we've seen this throughout our church as I've been reflecting on it the last five years. As I've been reflecting on it, I've seen miracles in our church. And I want to share some of them with you. Because if God's called us to be a church where miracles happen, I have to stir your faith to believe for some miracles. Now, I want to unapologetically say we are a supernatural church. And I'm going to explain what that means today in an in a extensive way. 
Because you see, if we're just natural, we end up looking like a lot of Picassos. But if we're supernatural, we end up looking how God intended us to look, how he wants us to look. As I think about different miracles in our house, I think about one that's pretty significant, and some of you have heard this story. It was in our fast in 2017 that we were praying and fasting, and I woke up from a dream. This dream was startling. It was so startling, I had to wake up my wife to explain this dream, and we had to begin to pray immediately. In my dream, I received a text message from Austin Fontenot, and in that text, he said, Victoria and Julia got in a car accident and died. I was devastated. I couldn't, I woke up in a panic, in a frenzy. I woke up my wife and we prayed and we just believed that, man, whatever this was, that that was not going to happen. And then a month later, you fast forward and I woke up to a text message. And the text message was from Austin Fontenot. And he said, Victoria, this girl who he was dating, and her sister, Julia, got hit by a drunk driver. And they're in the hospital. And it's really bad. As you can imagine, Austin was in panic. And I'm not trying to relive the horror of this. I want to relive something that God did. What God did in that moment was rally our church. It was in that moment that it was the day that we moved into this facility, this building, which was another miraculous story. And everybody gathered that morning, but instead of moving stuff in, they gathered together to pray. Let's start praying for these ladies. Let's start praying and believing for a miracle. Let's believe that God's going to do something supernatural. And as I ran to the hospital and met Austin, he told me that she is having open heart surgery right now. And then we need to start praying. We, we all started praying. And as we did, we believed that God was going to do a miracle. And then you have Julia, who's over here in another room, who, who is not even able to be with her sister in this moment. And so my wife's in there comforting her and loving her and praying for her. It was, a, it was this moment that, that we, the doctor comes out, the surgeon. And he comes out and he says, we, we were able to close up this severed artery. And she's in recovery, and we hope and believe that she's going to make a recovery. So we started believing and praying. And a week later, Victoria walks out of the hospital in her own power and own strength because God did a miracle. Now, we're clapping for that, but I want to just tell you where the miracle is. Okay, the miracle, you have the text message, you have the prayer, that was amazing. You have this doctor, but what the doctor said, we have never heard. What the doctor said is, I've seen so many people with this injury, where the rib severed the artery and was hanging on just barely, and no one has ever lived. No one has ever lived. She's our first miracle. It was a miracle story, and the doctor even said, this is a miracle. This is Victoria right here, one of our worship leaders. That's incredible. So I I just, there's miracles like that. There's miracles of Angela being healed of cancer. There's miracles of the the Patrons having a baby when they couldn't conceive, and we prayed for them, and the Lord opened their womb. There's there's miracles of jobs opening up in this this fast. I I just heard about um, from from the Villanuevas that that there, there was a job promotion for his wife just supernaturally, and it covered the provision that they needed. There's miracle after miracle after miracle happening. My best friend, J. Tom, who is a lawyer. He's a J.D. And, and the reason I say that because, you know, um, he just this man's integrity and who he is. He's not a hyper-emotional man. And he was helping us plant the church. And as we were planting the church, making disciples, loving people, loving the community, loving the city as we were doing this, he gets a Facebook message. From a random girl from high school. It came out of nowhere several years later, 10 years later. And she said, J. Tom, the Lord dropped into my heart that he wants to heal your back. I don't even know if you have back pain, but God wants to heal your back. And he's going to use your church 
to pray for you and you're going to get healed. I, I, saw this, I saw this picture. J. Tom thought that was so bizarre. But what she didn't know is J. Tom had a degenerative vertebrae. Not a disc, a vertebrae. The back of a, a, back of a 90-year-old. And he was always in back pain. He always had back pain. And, and there was a moment where we were in the church in, in my living room. And we were praying, encouraging one another, loving one another, sharing the gospel with one another. It was incredible. And, and J-Dum stood up and said, I think this is the moment the church is supposed to pray for me. So he gets in the middle of the living room and we all lay hands on him, believing that God's going to heal him. And God shoots him with power. It's like, it felt like a jolt. And he drops to his knees. This six foot two, 270 pound man drops to his knees. And I've never seen this man be emotional. I've never seen him be, like, you know, he's not the charismatic who's, who's up here dancing and waving hands. He, he drops to his knees and, and God touches him and heals his back. And he never complains of back pain. He never had back pain since that moment. Is that amazing? Like what God does, it's like <laughs> these miracles. And if you're Baptist, Church of Christ, or wh- however you grew up, you're like, ooh, this is, I thought this was a safe church. It is a safe church. It is a safe church. But you all came here for God. You came here to get closer to God and his presence. You didn't come here for, for, for something real nice that would just make you feel good and go on the week. You came here because you want God. You want who he is. You, you want his presence. You want him in your life. There's something that you realize that, that there's an end to me, and there has to be something more. And that's a miracle that you're here today because there was an end of you. Now that God comes in, he puts a miracle in your heart, and he brings you to church. That's a miracle. All of us have miracles. And I believe that God is going to do miraculous things in your life. Maybe it's in your job. Maybe it's in your marriage. He's going to raise a marriage. He's going to reconcile friendships. God's going to do miracles in this house. And we're going to be defined by it. So we believe that. So my friend growing up, Michael Moore, he, he was the fastest kid in the school. He, he, would, he, would, he, he would run everywhere. He would outrace everybody. He was just super fast. He, he loved to race, super competitive. You probably know this type of guy who, who just, he won't turn it off. Like, just turn it down a notch. You can't play anything with him because you get run over. And he loves to run, and that, that was always a hard part for me because I love to walk. You know, I don't run a lot. And, and, and Michael Moore one day was at a Christian concert in West Texas. It's called Rock the Desert. And we're out there, and the, the cars are parked far away from the venue, as you may notice, uh, from venues that you've been to. And they're walking in the median of this road. And he's walking with a group of the, the youth, and he challenges somebody to a race. Because that's what Michael does. He challenges people to race because he's fast and he wants to win. And then it, it gives him a confidence boost. I don't know. And, and so he challenges somebody to race and they start running, start racing as fast as they can go. Now, the thing about runners and competition is they turn off the mind and they just let the, let the feet take over. They don't think clearly. And, and Michael wasn't thinking that, hey, it's dark outside. Maybe I shouldn't be running. How many know you shouldn't run in the dark? Some of you probably shouldn't even walk in the dark. Some of you just need to go to bed. And so he's running, and then all of a sudden, boom, he falls headfirst into a cement drainage ditch. And his eye is split open, hanging over his eyeball. His lip is split. He's bleeding everywhere. And Michael's like, did I win? Did I win? You know? And and it was horrific, and it was bad, and they had to bandage him up, and and I, I just, I felt like that was appropriate because this next thing that Pastor Jim LaFoon said on that night, you, you're going to be a church marked by miracles, but you're also going to be a church. As 2 Corinthians 5 says, we will walk by faith, not by sight. We will walk by faith, not by sight. That we're walking in this place of trusting God, even though it may be dark around us, even though we may not be able to see, we're going to walk by faith, even though there may not be sight, we're going to walk. And C.S. Lewis would say this, Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. This is the context of that verse. 
Walking by faith means that you're thinking more about God and his supernatural uh, power and who he is in eternity and, and walking with God and hearing from him and start taking step in his direction. It, it, Christians who do that do more in this world than any other Christians. So I felt like we need to be a church that walks. And, and, and I love to move quickly. I love to move quickly, but when I realize you walk, you see more. I even found that to be true. Any of y'all take walks in the morning? <laughs> we got two healthy people in our church. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, you know, when you walk, you're able to see stuff. Uh, how many of you grew up without iPads or iPhones and you went on a car trip and you were bored to death and all you did was look out the window and it was like, Pah! and you put your face against the window <laughs> and you said, are we there yet? And then you would just stare at it like, what's out there? What am I looking at? And anytime something caught your interest, it was gone that quickly, you know, because when you're driving, you miss everything that's beautiful. You miss some of the scenery. You miss some of the things that are interesting. You, you, you miss some of, the, some of the view. When you're flying, you don't really get to see the experience. You just end up at the destination. And, and I think there's something important about walking because when you walk, you slow down. You're able to see what God wants you to see. You're able to see and enjoy the, the journey of life and what God has for you. And I think this is what God's called us to do, is that we would walk by faith, not by walk by faith, not by sight. But how do you do that when it's completely dark? How do you do that when it's completely dark outside? I want to practically give you some tools on how to walk and how we can do this as a church this year and in your life. Psalm 119, 105 says this. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. A lamp illuminates. A lamp begins to shine some lumens, but it, it doesn't shine so many where you can see a very far distance, does it? It just shines just enough so you can take one step at a time so that you can walk slowly by hearing and seeing Jesus and you can walk by faith. I, I love the flashlight. Where's the flashlight? Where's the laser beam? Can we just light this place up so I can start running again? Can we light this place up so we can start going? Pedal to the metal, Ben. If you know me, I talk real fast and, and I do a lot of things real fast. And yet my wife says I do a lot of things real slow. It's probably the latter. Your lamp your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your word is lighting my path. It's, it's lighting. You know, when the psalmist wrote this, the light or lamp was not even this bright. It, it didn't have any magnifying power. It didn't have a glass bowl around it. It didn't have anything that would, would make it magnificent or make the light shine bright. It was, it was a bowl. The lamp was a bowl made out of ceramic, and in there was oil, and there would be a little wick, and you would light it, and it looked more like a candle. And, and guess what? Lamps weren't made to walk with, or at least not walk with far back then. In fact, the lamp was used primarily in the house. You would use it for light in the house, but, but people didn't walk at night. They slept. You should try it. Your life will be better. No, 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 no. They, they didn't walk with this. And yet, when God calls you to walk, and there's dark places around you, and you're walking where maybe there's not a lot of light, you grab that lamp, and you take one step at a time. You start walking in his word. And I just think that this year, we need to start walking in God's word, in his truth. That we need to start lining our life up 
with his word. Guess what? His word will give you all the steps and all the direction that you need to take for your life. His word is going to give you uh, uh, who you should be friends with. His word is going to give you uh, the direction on what business decision will you make. His word will give you direction on the spouse that you're supposed to be marrying. If you're dating somebody and it doesn't line up with his word, you need to walk away from that and start walking in his word. If you, you have to start walking in his word, this will help business people all over the place because there's going to be decisions that you're going to have to make. And you're going to have to decide, am I going to do that or am I not? But Lord, if I go this way, there's all this provision. God, we, we will have so much in the bank. It'll be ridiculous. But did that line up with my word? Did you compromise any of my character and who I am to get to that destination? No, we walk in his word. This year has to be a year where we walk in his word. And that does not sound fun, does it? No, it doesn't. This message is not fun. <laughs> wants us to walk in his word. He also wants us to walk in the paradox of discipline. He wants us to walk in the paradox of discipline. What do you mean, Pastor Ben? You just like the word paradox because every pastor likes paradox. I do. I like it. It's awesome. It's awesome because, because here's what I mean by that is that you're going to move to a place that, that, that is supernatural. You're going to move in a place that is contradictory where you thought you were going. It's paradoxical how his, his rules, his law, how he works. It's amazing how you're going one direction and, and, then, and then God tells you to go a different direction and you do it and you obey it. And you actually find more fulfillment through that walking. Matthew chapter 5, I feel like of the eight Beatitudes, the first five are a little paradoxical for us and help us walk in this. Uh, think about it. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. What? No, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. I'm going to be comforted by working out and eating more and doing this. But, but if you actually mourn, if you actually open up yourself, then he can comfort. That doesn't seem right. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. The calm will inherit the land. No, I got to go get the land, man. I got to go take the land. I got to go get this. No, no, the calm, the meek will inherit the land. It's paradoxical. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. No, 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 Pastor Ben. I know how to be satisfied. I'm satisfied when I eat this. I'm satisfied when I do this. I'm satisfied when I'm on the iPad and gaming this much. I'm satisfied when I'm doing this, this, and that. No, 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 no. The righteous, the righteous, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied. You hunger and thirsting for pleasure will only make you long for more pleasure. You actually won't be satisfied if you keep hungry and thirsting for pleasure. Oh, oh man, I'm selfish over here. Oh, I'm going to take that. Oh, I'm going to use this cash envelope to buy this instead. You know, that's, that's my problem. And, and, and so, right, but, but the, the, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. I thought in order to get mercy, I had to punish somebody. In order to get mercy, I, had, I actually had to punish them in order to get mercy. That's how I'm going to get mercy. No, no, no. Just be merciful and you'll get mercy. So God has called us to walk in this paradox of disciplines. And what are the disciplines I'm talking about? The spiritual disciplines. Meditation would be one of them. That we are to walk in meditation. That our thoughts would be his thoughts. And we'd sit there and we think about You don't have time to think about it. You need to get going. You, you got to get the kid ready for school and get them fed and get them bathed and, and get them dressed and, and take them and fight San Antonio traffic. And, and you have to, you know, get them into school on time and not get a tardy. And, 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 and no, just meditation, just, just rest. And you're going to find that God adds. You, you, if we give thanks, another spiritual discipline, give thanks. I was fasting and praying about giving thanks this year. That's kind of dumb, right? I've just been so cynical. I've been so critical. I've been critical of everyone, of everything. Maybe because I had the flu and strep to start the year. Maybe it was just something like that. Maybe because Pastor Austin's killing the messages and he's preaching and I'm just so critical. You know, maybe I don't know why I'm critical, but I've just been critical and I've just been fasting, praying. Just give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks. 
Give thanks for all circumstances. Give thanks. Prayer, that we would start praying, that we'd have the spiritual discipline of praying, that we'd start serving, that we'd start fasting. How many of you glad the fast is over? How many of you know you may get to fast again this year? Yeah, praise the Lord. Spiritual discipline of fasting. And then also, I believe that we need to walk in the spiritual discipline of giving. Of giving. It's better to give than to receive. I want to explain this real quickly. Hannah, who goes to our church, who's a teacher for Southwest ISD in San Antonio. She heard a story about a young boy who was attending the school, and the young boy would come to her school, and one day he would wear shoes, and the next day he would wear socks with a rubber bottom. You know, the grips on the bottom of the socks. And then the next day, he would wear shoes. Then the next day, he would wear socks. Well, somebody stops this boy and says, why don't you wear your shoes every day? Like, you need to wear your shoes every day. And the boy said, I would love to. But you see, my brother and I, we only have one pair of shoes. So one day, he wears them. And one day, I wear them. And we alternate. I just felt like. God is calling us to walk, and if we're going to walk, we need to walk in giving. So we put up a shoe wall, a shoe wall to help keep the vision in front of us, that these shoes would be shoes that we'd be able to give away to those in need. We've been working with Christian Assistant Ministries, and uh, we've, we've been clothing the homeless and those in need, and now we're going to give shoes. And all year, we're going to give shoes away, and we're going to adopt different schools and different people and different organizations, and we're going to give shoes away. And and what's going to happen is next Sunday, we're going to have a donation bin in the foyer, and you can bring shoes. And guess what? We're not going to just do this next Sunday because it's not an event for us. It's going to be something that we do all year. Oh, I'm not getting paid this week. Well, then the next week, give shoes. And every time you bring a pair of shoes, we're going to take one pair of shoes off. We're going to give it away, and we're going to put your pair of shoes up here. And when your pair of shoes are up here, you're going to be reminded, I need to start walking in giving. I need to start walking in how God wants me to give. I need to start walking in the goodness of God. I need to start walking this out because I don't want this just to be a three-week fast prayer experience with God. I want him to show up the next 49 weeks this year. Can you get an amen? Come on. I mean, this is what we want. So let us walk by the Spirit. Let us walk by the Word. Let us walk in this paradox of discipline. But let us walk by the Spirit, that we'd be Spirit-led in our giving. That it wouldn't just be giving to give. That we'd be giving. Lord, what do you want me to give? Lord, what kind of shoes do you want me to give? Lord, what what do you want me to give today? How do you want me to be generous as I walk it out? Let me walk by the Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says this. But say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit sets against the flesh. But these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Walk by the Spirit. Walk by it. And when you're walking by it, God's going to lead you. He's going to show you. As you're walking by the Spirit, you're being led by the lamp. As you're being led by the lamp, you're walking by the Spirit, and you're showing him. He's showing you where to go. And what happens is your Picasso starts to look more like the Imago Dei, the image of God. You start to look like him, and you start to act like him. You start to love like him. You start to walk it out, and then we're going to walk in discipleship. You see, as you're walking in the word, as you're walking in these paradoxes of discipline, as you're you're walking in the spirit, you're going to walk in discipleship. You're going to grab somebody next to you and say, hey, man, they've been talking about this purple book thing for a long time. In fact, they talk about it all the time. In fact, I'm kind of tired of it. I don't even like the color purple. And so, but you're going to grab a purple book, and you're going to grab somebody and say, let's do this together. It's walking discipleship. Hey, I'll teach you, but you teach me, and let Jesus teach both of us. Like, let let that happen in discipleship, and let God start doing something amazing. And and here's the thing. When you're walking in discipleship, and you're walking towards him, and towards what God has for you, that means you're walking away from something. 
Anytime you walk in a direction, you're walking away from something behind you. You're walking away from some baggage, some past, which tried to define you. You're walking away from all those idols, all those gods in your life. You're starting to walk away from that, and you start walking towards God. This is what he would have for you, that you would walk towards one thing, so you walk away from something else. The one thing that we walk towards is Jesus. And Jesus modeled this as he went to the disciples. He said, come, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Come follow me. Be my disciples. And when the disciples heard that, you know what some of them did? They they left their net in the boat because they were fishermen. These two particular disciples left their net in the boat, and they left their father to tend to the nets. Say, hey, father, we got got to go because Jesus is calling us to go this way, and I got to walk where he has called me to walk. I got to walk it out as he has called me to walk it out. I got to take step and take stride of what God has done in my life. I got to start moving in his direction. I got to move away from this and towards him. God's going to call you to walk away from some certain things in your life. There may be a certain job. There may be certain friendships. There may be certain Certain cities, there may be certain communities, maybe certain apartments into another apartment so that you can start walking to Jesus and start making disciples there and start loving people there and start being what Jesus has called you to be. And lastly, we're going to walk in community. We are going to walk in community with one another. First John 1, 7 says this, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. That we would walk with him, and when we do walk with him, we walk in community with one another. And we see each other, and we do life together, and we start walking in and out. How many of you ever gone up to somebody and said, hey, let's run together? Hey, man, you want to run together? If you ask me to run together, I'm going to say, no thanks. I don't run. But if you can, hey amen, let's walk together. Let's walk arm in arm. Let's walk hand in hand. Let's walk it out. Let's walk this out. Sign me up. I want to walk. I want to walk where Jesus has called. And the good news and the great news is, is that Jesus has allowed us to walk because he walked. You see, Jesus went before us. He went before us on earth. He went before us on the cross. He went before us in death, in the grave, and he went before us in resurrection, and he went before us in ascension to heaven. And as we follow him, we find ourselves going where he has called us to go, to be with him where he wants us to be. A light never works when it's behind you, right? They they don't call them rear lights. They call them headlights. The lamp was made to be in front of you. The lamp leads your walking. Jesus is before us. Jesus is ahead of us. And as we look to Jesus, we can walk as he's called us to walk. Church, would you stand with me this morning? As the lamp is in front of us, I want to remind us of Deuteronomy 31.8. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or abandon you. Do Do not fear or be dismayed. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. See that bass? That's how much he wants to go with you. He will not fail you or abandon you. Do not fear or be dismayed. The thing that I think about that keeps us from walking, the thing that keeps everyone from walking by faith is usually, and I think almost always, fear. It's just I'm too afraid to trust that light. I want to go my way. And when fear comes about, you do one of two things. 
it's flight or fight. Or it's run ahead of the light or stay here and just fight with yourself and argue with yourself and don't trust him and don't believe him and I'm just going to stay right here and I'm not going to move. I'm going to run ahead of the light. I'm going to outrun it. I'm going to run and do my own thing or I'm just going to stay here and I'm just going to fight myself and I'm just going to do that. But I'm going to tell you, God has given you the grace to lace up your shoes and to start walking. He's giving you the grace to lace up your shoes and start walking. And that's why when everybody leaves here today, you're going to get some shoelaces. They were going to be custom, but UPS lost them. So we got these. But these are the reminder. The grace to lace up your shoes and start walking in the grace that he has before you but Lord I just don't know if it's going to happen how long do I have to walk trust him trust him you'll walk as long as you need to so that you start looking like him when you start looking like him you won't want to stop walking Father we thank you and we praise you as we sing this song that you will do it again. We remind it in Acts 17, 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. For in him we live, we move, we have our being. It is in Jesus, but following the light, by being in the light, by being illuminated with the light, that because we trust you, we love you, your grace is sufficient for us in our weakness, and we will have the grace to lace it up and to walk according to your will and according to your promise. God, will we sing that and declare that, that you are enough, and we will see you move and do it again in Jesus' name.